Hello and welcome to Battle Cry, one of India's most watched weekend shows and the only show that gets you up close with India's warriors, weapons and the defense of this country. This week, as the disengagement in eastern Ladakh is paralyzed by a duplicitous China, India has pushed more tanks into Ladakh than ever before and has also learned that it needs to rethink tank warfare in the mountains. Indian tanks have fought in the mountains before, even in Ladakh, but that was half a century ago. And since then, the country's armored strength has been focused on the plains and the desert sectors bordering, as you may have guessed, Pakistan. Hardly any of it has been pointed at our other neighbor. Well, China's hostile actions and rapid mobilization of weaponry and armored vehicles in the current standoff has forced the Indian army to revisit an old need for lighter tanks capable of navigating the challenges at the Himalayan heights. There are few sights more terrifying than this one. Battle tanks kicking up dust as they approach. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh got a taste of this when he visited Ladakh last month. He even posed with the proud crew of an Indian Army's T-90 tank. Sizable numbers of these Russian-origin tanks have been deployed in Ladakh since tensions began. But behind the growl of these beasts, there's a major churn. The long-held realization that these heavy tanks are far more suited to the plains than the mountains of Ladakh, limiting their agility and access in the high altitudes. And with China deploying an agile light tank in the depth areas of the Ladakh fiction points, the Indian Army has decided to urgently act on a decade-old requirement for similar machines. But first, why are such tanks necessary? Unlike the heavy battle tanks that the Indian Army uses, light tanks would have unmatched agility in mountainous terrain and therefore be able to fetch up or access more areas. They would be capable of rapid movement and very importantly, their size and weight means they can be air transported at short notice. And that's where Indian industry is seeing a major opportunity. What you're looking at is Army's K-9 Vajra, a tracked gun system, basically a heavy artillery gun mounted onto a light tank chassis. Seen here with Prime Minister Modi, the K-9 is a Korean system that is licensed built by Indian industrial giant Larson & Tubro in Gujarat. It is this vehicle that is being proposed as the base for India's new light tank. What India's Defence Research and Development Organisation has proposed is to take K-9's tank-like hull and replace the heavy artillery gun with a smaller 105mm gun imported from Belgium. The second option is to take the K-9 hull and replace the heavy artillery gun with the gun turret on the Army's T-90 Bhishma tank. In either case, a light tank prototype could be rolled out in 18 months. The Indian Army has an import option from Russia and the Indian option in front of it. It must decide now. With Shivarur, Bureau Report, India Today. 
Joining me live here on Battle Cry, as always, two of India's best known and most experienced defense correspondents, Sandeep Punithan and Gaurav Savant, both from India today. Sandeep, coming to you first, you're the journalist who broke the story on how the Indian Army's light tank requirement could be met with an Indian solution in the near term. India is already building the K-9, which is an artillery system, but that could somehow be modified to meet this light tank requirement. Well, absolutely, Shiv. The requirement for a light tank in the Indian Army has been there for several decades. And uh, what I'm hearing is that now the urgency is the enemy is at the gates, is what I'm being told. It's too late now for research and development. We need tanks as of the day before yesterday. So the first option is to immediately import them from a foreign country, a tank that is already in service. And for the larger numbers, to make up the numbers, we are looking at uh, an indigenous alternative that would come from the K-9 Vajra, as you mentioned, uh, which could in involve modifying the Vajra with a new turret to make it a light tank. Shiv. In 2013, the Chinese army had intruded 18 kilometers into Indian territory in the flatlands of northern Ladakh's Depsang sector. This year, too, they've scaled up that aggression deploying tanks and are aggressively blocking Indian patrols even more than before. Well, in response, India has deployed a whole tank regiment in the area for the first time at this scale since the 1962 war. India Today's Manjeet Negi has the details. An unusual stretch of flatland nestled in the mighty Himalayas of Ladakh. Welcome to Depsang, a forbidding high altitude plain on the line of actual control between India and China. Situated north of the current friction points of eastern Ladakh, Depsang has festered with incursions for over a decade and is now seeing a major mobilization. India has deployed more than 15,000 troops and nearly an entire tank division in Depsang and Dalat Beg Oldi sectors of northern Ladakh to contain an aggressive China which has scaled up blockades to Indian foot and vehicle convoys across patrolling points in the sectors. Several armoured units have been moved from the plains and adjoining areas to check the Chinese army, which has also brought in its tanks and other armoured vehicles there. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh was given a demonstration of similar tanks in Stakna, Ladakh in July and even met with the tank crews deployed there. Unlike the uneven terrain of other parts of Ladakh, the Depsang plains provide a vast stretch of flatland conducive to tank warfare. The Indian Army tank regiments have been spread all along the area from the Karakoram Pass to the Depsang plain where there is ample scope and space for deployment and fighting by armoured vehicles. In 2013, this was the sector in which Chinese forces had famously intruded 18 kilometers into the Indian side and squatted for many weeks together before finally being persuaded to leave. While China has mounted temporary incursions ever since then, India is taking no chances now and that's why the mobilization. The Depsang Plain is just north of the Galwan Valley and is connected by the Dubruk Shyok Dalat Begoldi Road on the main highway connecting eastern Ladakh with Leh. With Manjeet Negi in Delhi, Bureau Report, India Today. Gaurav, coming to you on the current deployments that are taking place in Ladakh. You know, you've just returned from the DBO sector. You were at the Depsang Plains where this entire regiment of T-90 tanks has currently been deployed. But very crucially, you're the first journalist who had access, you know, to that highway to the subsector North Gaurav. And you've reported that mobility is now vastly improved. And that means that Indian tanks have much greater access in the northern parts of Ladakh. 
Shiv, you're absolutely right. This 255-kilometer road from Durbuk through Shok to Dolatbeg Oldi is indeed proving to be a game-changer. The road is being made and improved even as forces deploy. Uh, and in some cases, where they've noticed for the movement of heavier equipment, uh, whether it's tanks or howitzers, you've noticed that the initial track was only for smaller vehicles or B vehicles. Yeah. Now, another road with a gentler gradient is being prepared uh, for the A vehicles to be moved as quickly as possible. And the better prepared we are, lesser are the chances of the adversary trying something. And Shiv, as you've reported, as Sandeep's reported, we also have an advanced landing ground at Dolatbeg Oldi, the world's highest ALG, at 16,696 feet. So we've had a landing in 1962 till about 65, then again in 2008 and 2013. That advanced landing ground in that extremely strategic outpost will again prove to be a game changer along with this road, Shiv. Gaurav and Sandeep, thanks as always for being with me on this episode of Battle Cry. India currently operates three types of main battle tanks and like we told you the army is also looking for tanks more suited to high altitude warfare like in places like Ladakh. But India has fought several tank battles in the past and has a history of importing and license building these armored beasts. From the American Sherman to the British Vickers, here's a snapshot of India's tryst with that icon of the land battle, the battle tank, and importantly where we are headed now in armored warfare. So we've told you how the Indian Army is on an urgent quest for light tanks, capable of mobility and firepower on Himalayan terrain. But what does the Indian Army's current tank fleet look like? To appreciate the current tank fleet, let's first give you a flashback. In the past, India has used a whole host of imported battle tanks and deployed them in wars as well. These include the Vijayanta, a license-built version of the British Vickers Mark I, the Soviet T-55, which India used extensively in the 1971 war, notably in the Battle of Basantar, where Indian armor destroyed large numbers of Pakistani tanks. The British Centurion tank that saw action in the 65 and 71 wars, and even the American M4 Sherman. All of these vintage tanks are mercifully no longer in service, with some of them now museum pieces all over the country. India's current fleet is decidedly more modern. The T-72, called Ajaya in India, is the tank the Indian Army has in largest numbers. Armed with a 120mm smoothbore cannon, the T-72 is a workhorse that entered Indian service in the early 80s and has since been licensed produced locally as well as improved with upgrades and updates. Built for tank warfare in the plains, the T-72 has nevertheless been a prominent presence during the current Ladakh standoff. At the turn of the millennium, shortly after the Kargil War, India ordered over 300 T-90 tanks from Russia. A deeply improved version of the earlier T-72, the T-90 sports a higher caliber gun, improved fire control system, more powerful engine and overall more robust survivability and capabilities. The T-90 is also license built by the Ordnance Factory Board near Chennai in large numbers with the Indian Army expecting to operate over 2,000 of these very capable beasts. A whole regiment of these tanks has been deployed in Ladakh and they were visible when Defence Minister Rajnath Singh visited last month. The Arjun is India's indigenous main battle tank, with 124 currently in service in the desert sectors. 
The Arjun tank program has had an extended development cycle. Originally commissioned as a project by Indira Gandhi after the 1971 war, the tank has had a troubled path, not least because of a reluctant customer in the Indian Army. It is currently India's heaviest tank with a majorly improved version called the Arjun Mark II awaiting long-anticipated orders from the Indian Army. The Arjun is however too heavy for high altitude operations and has therefore not been deployed in Ladakh. Indian weapon scientists had once tried to combine the agility of the T-72 with the brute power of the Arjun's gun turret, designating it the Tank X. But the Indian Army said the vehicle did not meet their requirements on multiple fronts, effectively ending that effort. Planning for the decades ahead, the Indian Army has already begun studying a requirement for a future main battle tank in a pursuit called Future Ready Combat Vehicle or FRCV. A program that will likely see India's private sector defense giants like the Tata Group, LNT, Bharat Forge and others contend for a piece of the lucrative armored vehicle pie. Bureau Report, India Today. While India fine-tunes its tank fleet and looks for more specialized battle tanks, it's important to also tell you about the country's tank killers. That is, weaponry specifically designed to defeat and destroy battle tanks. Because as much as the country invests in battle tanks themselves, the strides being made in the munitions that can kill these tanks has been enormous. And India is well aware. We've told you about India's current tanks. We've shown you the kind of tanks India is looking for. But apart from tanks and their primary guns, what other weaponry does India deploy to defeat and destroy tanks? The Army operates a variety of tank-killing munitions called anti-tank guided missiles or ATGMs. Missiles built specifically to pierce the tough skins of armored vehicles and destroy them from the inside. These weapons include infantry anti-tank weapons like the newly procured Spike from Israel. The Milan 2T from France, a missile that's been licensed manufactured for many years in India. And the Russian Cornet. India's DRDO has also begun to test an indigenous man-portable ATGM with initial firings throwing up very promising results. The Indian Army has also long tested the NAG anti-tank missile and its carrier called the Namika, an infantry fighting vehicle chassis. Operated in small numbers, the NAG is still to find deep adoption in the Indian Army, which is looking for expanded capabilities on the long-developed system. Easily the most feared tank killers in the Indian arsenal are also its newest entrants. The Indian Air Force's new AH-64E Apache attack helicopters. These come armed with the American AGM-114 Hellfire missile capable of destroying tanks at range and with devastating accuracy. The Apache's ability to hunt enemy armor from long ranges and from behind obstacles like hills make this depth from above for enemy tanks. And that's one of the reasons why you've seen the Apaches deployed during the current standoff. The Indian Army's indigenous armed helicopters, the HAL-built Rudra, 
and soon to be ordered light combat helicopter are meant to deploy anti-tank weaponry but haven't yet been integrated with the capability owing to chronic bureaucratic delays and slippages in planning. While a helicopter launched version of the Israeli Spike and the German PARS-3 anti-tank missiles have been considered in the past, India's DRDO has been developing and testing the Helena missile, most recently seen in its new avatar as the Dhruvastra. It is unclear when this weapon will enter service though, making it likely that the Indian Army will be forced to look to import anti-tank missiles for its indigenous armed helicopters for the foreseeable future. Bureau Report, India Today. That's it then on this episode of Battle Cry. We'd like to thank all our viewers once again for making us one of the most watched shows on the weekend. We'll see you again next week. And as we always say, remember, our country's true strength will only be realized when no human needs to be sent into battle and no weapon fired. <laughs>